For this week's lab, I want to um, make a couple of points. Um, it's going to be relatively straightforward uh, and easy, so it won't be nearly as time consuming uh, as some of the exercises that you've gone to uh, or gone through up to this point. So uh, you should be able to relax a little bit um, this week. Uh, remember, this is a course uh, in evolution and ecology. Um, and there's a reason for that, and that's primarily because uh, ecology makes absolutely no sense except in the context of evolution. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to define exactly what we mean by um, evolution. Uh, and I'll begin by pointing out two things. First of all, all sorts of things evolve. Uh, Betty Crocker cake mix boxes have evolved uh, over the decades. Automobiles have certainly evolved. Um, that kind of evolution is simply change over time, uh, and that's not um, necessarily all that interesting to us. Uh, what we're talking about is a very specific kind of um, change, uh, and that is changes in allele frequencies over time, and uh, that's what this lab uh, is going to be all about, uh, how those allele frequencies change over time. So we need to define what alleles are and what allele frequencies are, uh, and we will get to that. Um, let's begin, though, by talking a little bit um, about one of the greatest ideas uh, in modern science, and that would be uh, Charles Darwin's idea of uh, natural selection. Now, everyone, when they think of Darwin, they think of evolution, uh, and it's important to remember uh, that Darwin is not famous because of his quote-unquote theory of evolution. Uh, Darwin is famous because he figured out how evolution worked. Uh, there were, at the time of Darwin, lots of different quote-unquote theories for evolution. Um, the difficulty was that nobody had figured out how it worked. For example, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck uh, had a theory of evolution that uh, that postulated that evolution was via acquired characteristics. Uh, so they would explain the fact that giraffes had long necks by this constant striving by giraffes to reach leaves that were higher and higher in the canopy. Uh, and then by stretching their necks out, they would then acquire that characteristic. Well, we now know that that's a silly idea, um, but that was the uh, one of the prevailing theories of evolution at the time. Uh, nobody understood how evolution worked. Um, there was, interestingly enough, somebody alive at the same time as Charles Darwin, um, and that was a uh, monk working as a botanist, um, Gregor Mendel, uh, who had essentially figured out uh, many of the key ideas that Darwin would have benefited from, uh, and that was namely how information gets from one generation to the next. Uh, you have to remember that in, at this time, uh, nobody had really a concept of genes or alleles or DNA or anything of that sort. Nobody knew how information was transmitted from one generation to the next. Um, now, Darwin and, and Mendel never met. Uh, it would be interesting uh, to know how things would be different had they met, but uh, they never met. They never knew of each other's work. So uh, those were different days. What Charles Darwin is famous for is uh, he had the, these very simple observations and he figured out um, how all of this, this worked. Uh, and he did this because he had passenger or pigeons at any rate. Uh, he bred birds and, and he understood how uh, characteristics were passed on uh, from one generation of birds to the next. And he made a series of five observations. Uh, and I'd like to go through those observations with you. Uh, the first is uh, that there is variation amongst organisms. In other words, no two organisms are exactly alike. And uh, you can think of that when you look around at your circle of friends, you have no two friends that are exactly alike. We're all a little bit different from one another. Uh, some of us are taller, shorter, wider, um, bigger feet, smaller feet, bigger hands, smaller hands, uh, blue eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, uh, whatever, dark skin, light skin, uh, curly hair, straight hair, whatever. Uh, there are no, peop no two people that are exactly alike. Even identical twins are not strictly identical. There is some variation there. Uh, so Darwin understood that. He 
observed that clearly in his birds. Now, some of that variation, uh, and that's Darwin's second observation, is passed on from one generation to the next. Not all of it, but some of it is. Uh, we say that that variation is heritable, it's inherited. Uh, so, for example, if you are um, a white person, uh, chances are both of your parents are white. It would be highly unusual for two black parents uh, to give birth to a white baby. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see that, and you don't see that. Uh, so that information that codes for skin color is being passed on from uh, the parental generation to the uh, to the generation of the progeny. So some of that variation, not all of it, but some of it uh, is heritable. Uh, now, clearly your body mass, part of your body mass, your weight, uh, might be a consequence of your genetics, uh, but part of it is a consequence of your lifestyle, right? So that's why we say not all of that variation uh, is heritable, but some of it is. Uh, we also understand that some forms of variation are better than others, and this is Darwin's third observation. Uh, namely, uh, it's better to have good eyesight than poor eyesight. It's better to have good hearing than bad hearing. If you have really poor eyesight and very poor hearing, uh, it's unlikely as a, as a human that you're going to see the car coming or uh, know that the, the wolf is at the door and is going to kill you or something. Uh, your sensory system enables you to detect potential threats. So having good a good sensory system is positive. Uh, similarly, if you have alleles that code for type 1 diabetes, uh, chances are you're not going to live very long, right? So it's better not to have those uh, alleles than, than to have them, all right? So you can think of all sorts of attributes, um, your own body or your friend's bodies or whatever, that are preferred over other sorts of attributes, and Darwin recognized that. Now, there are two observations that Darwin um, got from the literature, and that was from the writings of a fellow named Malthus. Uh, and what Malthus noted, he was a, um, a mathematician, what Malthus noted was that populations tend to grow uh, exponentially. Um, so you can graph that for yourself. Uh, bacteria would be a good example. Um, at time zero, you have one bacterial cell, and 30 minutes later, you have two. 30 minutes later, you have four, and 30 minutes later, you have eight, and then 16, 32, uh, 64, 128, and so on. It's that, that is a kind of growth that is exponential. So uh, the, the steepness of the curve just increases. Well, the same thing has happened to the human population, right? The human population is growing exponentially, uh, and it's doubling roughly every 35 to 40 years. So uh, by the time you are my age, you can imagine that there will be twice as many people on the planet as there are now, right? That is just a consequence of, of how populations grow. Uh, the same is true for cockroaches and fruit flies and uh, whatever mice or uh, fescue or whatever it happens to be, but organisms populations of organisms tend to grow exponentially. Uh, so those are the first four of Darwin's observations. Um, there is variation amongst organisms. That variation is heritable. Some forms of variation are better than others. Populations tend to grow exponentially. Uh, the fifth observation is important because that says that populations cannot grow exponentially for very long. And the reason for that is simply that there is a limit to how large populations can get. Uh, well, that's certainly true for the human population. Uh, imagine if the human population doubles um, so that instead of having 7 billion people on the planet, there are 14 billion. Uh, the demand for water is going to be considerably higher and food, and yet our ability to grow food will not have doubled. Uh, and if the population grows again so that suddenly there are doubles again so that suddenly there are 14 billion people on the planet or or I guess 28 billion people on the planet, uh, then clearly we're not going to have enough water. We're not going to have enough food. We won't have enough space. We won't have enough oil or energy or all those sorts of things. So there is an upper limit to how large the population can be. And Malthus recognized that and Darwin understood that as well.
Well, what happens when we get close to that upper limit? What happens simply is that more offspring are produced than can possibly survive, right? So that is essentially the conclusion that Darwin draws, right? That more offspring are produced than can possibly survive. And the consequence of that then is very simple. Those organisms with the better forms of variation are going to be the ones that survive longer and produce more offspring. The ones with the poorer forms of variation won't. Well, what defines better and poor forms of variation? Well, that's context specific. Uh, so what's better now might not be what's better in a thousand years or what's better today may not be what's better um, tomorrow or next year or last year, something of that sort. So that is something that is determined by by nature. That's not something that we can um, that we can anticipate. At any rate, uh, that's Darwin's great idea, right? These five observations and then his logical conclusion from those observations, uh, namely that those organisms with the better forms of variation survive longer and produce more offspring. Now you have no doubt uh, heard um, people talk about survival of the fittest and that's where that idea comes from, right? This notion that, um, let's see if I can change, uh, that notion that, um, there we go, um, that notion that uh, this, this whole idea of survival of the fittest, uh, Darwin never said that, right? Darwin, and, and who knows why he didn't use that, um, that phrase. Uh, it's, it's implicit, right? But when we think of fitness, we're thinking of fitness in a fundamentally different way. Now, that whole concept of survival of the fitness was actually... Um, developed after Darwin, right? And that was used in during the Great Depression and during the whole uh, movement in this country to unionize workers and so on. Uh, it was used by business people to justify something referred to as social Darwinism. Um, so back in the 20s, uh, people were using that idea. So a hundred years ago, people were using that idea, the survival of the fittest, right, to exclude certain classes of people or certain workers and things of that sort. Uh, and it also justified uh, businesses' idea that they could form monopolies and screw the, the general public and so on because it was all about social Darwinism, the survival of the fittest. Uh, so that's not what we mean by um, when, as ecologists or evolutionary biologists, that's not the idea that we're uh, trying to get across. Uh, we have sort of a different view. What we mean when we talk about fitness is not physical fitness or anything of that sort. It's simply your ability to um, survive and to produce progeny. So when we talk about fitness, we're talking about something referred to as um, inclusive fitness, uh, which is really the sum total of all the offspring that you were able to or really, it's the sum total of all the copies of your alleles that you're able to get into subsequent generations. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, right? What that means is uh, that you can have high inclusive fitness without ever having children of your own. And the way you can do that uh, is if you have siblings or cousins or something of that sort, every time your siblings or, or cousins have offspring, um, those offspring are carrying some of your alleles, right? So your your brothers and sisters each have a certain proportion of your alleles, approximately 0.5, right? And so every time they produce offspring, uh, your, your nephew is going to have 25% of your alleles and so on. So um, you can improve your inclusive fitness without ever having children of your own. So uh, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so uh, you're going to talk about, and we've already talked about this um, early on in, uh, during the first introductory class, uh, about how the fact, the idea that evolution is not uh, is not theory, it's law. Uh, we've talked about um, hypothesis, theory, law, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, we're not going to go into that. Uh, what we want to do now is we want to talk a little bit about um, how evolution works. So we're not going to go into the various forms of selection and so on. We'll save that for later. Uh, 
Uh, what we want to do instead is we want to talk about how allele frequencies change over time. Okay, so we've uh, defined um, evolution as a change in allele frequencies over time. Uh, and I guess we need to define what, a, what an allele is. Um, you have all sorts of uh, genes in your, in your body, right? Uh, each molecule of DNA is, in actuality, uh, a sequence of genes. Uh, each gene is really nothing more than a location on the DNA molecule. Um, and that location then codes for certain information. Uh, now, for example, in, in terms of eye color, uh, there is a gene for eye color. Um, there are different forms of that gene. There might be a form that codes for blue eyes and a different form that codes for brown eyes. We refer to those forms as alleles. So uh, you have alleles for blue eyes or alleles for brown eyes. Uh, you have eye color genes, but the alleles are what code for the specific kind of character that you're going to have. Uh, now, when we talk about um, a gene pool, we're talking about the sum of all genes in a population, right? So uh, the way we're going to characterize the gene pool is by measuring the allele frequency. So of all the alleles that are in the population, uh, what proportion of them code for blue eyes or what proportion code for brown eyes? So that's the sort of thing that we're uh, trying to um, get at. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that by talking about pea plants, which is what Gregor Mendel did. Uh, and the pea plants that Gregor Mendel was working with, uh, there were some that had red flowers and some that had white flowers. And uh, this is a nice system because it's very simple. Uh, flower color in pea plants is controlled by a single um, gene. Uh, and in this system, there are only two alleles. Uh, and we're not going to concern ourselves too much with that at the moment. Um, there are uh, dominant and recessive alleles. Uh, so obviously, um, in organisms that reproduce sexually, half the alleles will come from the female parent and half the alleles will come from the male parent. Uh, so within each um, somatic cell, you're going to have uh, two copies of each allele. Um, actually, you end up having multiple copies, right? But it, for our purposes, we're just going to think of it in terms of that one single copy. Um, so in pea plants, if both of your copies are the dominant, and we usually denote the dominant with a capital letter and the recessive by a small letter, if both um, alleles are the big R form, then the flower is going to be red. If both alleles are this little r form or the recessive form, uh, then the flower ends up being white. Uh, and in this case, uh, you have complete dominance so that if you have a mixture, a big R and a little r, uh, then the flower is going to be red. Uh, let's simplify that um, and let's not have complete dominance. And, and uh, so this is just a, a makeup sort of situation. And the reason for that is computational uh, in the homework that you're going to do. It'll make your life a little bit easier, but the, the idea is going to be the same. Uh, so in actuality, we're going to have um, three different genotypes. We're going to have big R, big R, big R, little r, and little r, little r. So big R, big R is going to be red. Big R, little r is referred to as the heterozygote. And we'll imagine that it's going to have pink flowers. And then little r, little r is referred to as homozygous recessive. So big R, big R is homozygous dominant, red flowers. Big R, little r is heterozygous. Hetero means different. And then little r, little r is homozygous recessive. And those are going to be the white flowers. Okay. Um, so there we have our situation, right? Let's imagine that we have 100 individuals in the population. Um, and that means then, because each individual has two alleles, that means there are a total of 
200 flower color alleles in this population. Uh, the number of those alleles that are big R is going to be the allele frequency of big R, and 1 minus that is going to be the allele frequency of little r. Okay, so uh, if we do that um, and we note that the frequency of big R changes from one generation to the next from, say, 0.2 to 0.3, uh, then we know that evolution has occurred. So what we care about is changes in the allele frequencies, okay, not the genotype frequency. So the allele frequency is the frequency of the, le of the alleles the genotype frequency, right, is going to be big R, big R, big R, little r, little r, little r, that sort of thing. And the phenotypes are, the phenotype frequencies are going to be those with red flowers, those with pink flowers, those with white flowers. What we care about is allele frequencies, not all the other stuff. Okay, so for our example, if we had 30 individuals that were um, big R, big R, each of those individuals has two copies of the allele, so that's 2 times 300. Um, plus, all of the heterozygotes have one copy of the big R allele, so that's another 20. So 2 times 30 is 60, plus 20 is 80. There were a total of 200 alleles in the population, so 80 divided by 200 is 0.4. So the frequency of the big R allele is 0.4. And we can do that for, um, for the little r allele. We usually refer to lowercase p as the frequency of the, of the big R and lowercase q as the frequency of the little r. And then p plus q is going to be equal to 1 because these are probabilities. Um, that also means that 1 minus p is going to be equal to q, so we noticed that p was equal to 0.4, so then obviously q is going to be equal to 0.6. All right, so uh, p plus q is equal to 1. Um, if a population reproduces panmictically, and what we mean by panmictically um, is that they breed at random. And there are lots of plants that do that. So maple trees, for example, um, the pollen just gets dumped out into the atmosphere and gets spread by the wind. And wherever the pollen lands, uh, that's where fertilization is going to take place. So the gametes are essentially just mixing at random um, fish do the same thing. Some fish do the same thing. The males will just dump their uh, sperm into the water. The females dump their eggs into the water, and they just sort of meet up by chance. So we can model um, what the likelihood then is of alleles coming together. So if the alleles are meeting at random, uh, it's pretty easy. So if you want to know what the probability of getting big R, big R is, so a big R sperm meeting up with a big R egg, well, the probability of the big R allele is P. So the probability of big R meeting big R is going to be P times P, which is P squared. Okay, well, if you're thinking about this just a little bit, P plus Q is equal to 1. So we can model reproduction by taking the quantity P plus Q and squaring it. And if we do that, then we get this expression down here. So you can think back to your algebra class that you had in high school. Multiply P times Q times P times Q, and you end up with this nice little term right here. P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. Well, if P plus Q is equal to 1, and p plus q quantity squared is equal to this term, well, one quantity squared is still one. So notice that this is still a probability statement, right? So p squared, which is going to be how many big R big R's you have, two times p times q is going to be how many heterozygotes you have, and q squared is going to be how many homozygous recessives you have. So here it is. Here's the way we model reproduction, right? P plus Q quantity squared, and that shows us what we then get in the next generation.
All right, so what we're going to do now is model um, what happens here. And there are a couple of points that I want to make. Um, and that is that if the population is reproducing panmictically and, no, and there is no selection, so no alleles are favored or disfavored, uh, you're going to end up with something that's called Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Uh, so the system is going to settle down into an equilibrium condition uh, and nothing is going to change. So the allele frequencies are not going to change unless something happens. Okay. So as long as the basic assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium hold, the, the system is never going to change. Well, what are the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? Uh, there are a couple of them. The first and most important one is panmictic breeding. So panmictic breeding is breeding at random. Well, you don't have to think about that too long to realize that for the most part, maple trees and, and grass and whatnot are the exceptions. Many organisms, though, don't breed panmictically. And if you think about your own um, experience, uh, people don't breed at random either. We tend to be pretty careful about who we decide to mate with. So human beings do not breed panmictically. Of course, the other thing that's necessary for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to hold is that there's equal survival and equal reproduction of individuals. And you know that's not true either because some people live to ripe old ages and some people die very young. And you also know that some people have lots of kids and some people don't have any kids at all. So we don't have equal survival and reproduction either. The next important point is that the population is closed. That is, there's no immigration and there's no emigration. And you know that that isn't true either. Uh, just look at what's happened across the entire globe. Uh, with or without a wall across the Mexican border, there is a lot of migration that is taking place. There is a lot of gene flow. The human population is not closed. It's not closed in the United States. It's not closed in any country on the planet. Full stop, right? Um, people have a way of moving. And it's not just people. Pigeons do it. Starlings do it. Cardinals do it, right? There is gene flow in the population. Uh, and the final um, thing is that uh, we have to assume, in order to have Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have to assume that there is no migration, or rather, no mutation. In other words, alleles don't mutate, they don't change. Well, you know that's not true, and all you have to do is think about the, the coronavirus. Um, right now, we have discovered the South African variants uh, and the UK variant. Um, so even the coronavirus has mutated. In fact, mutations happen about once in every one million cell divisions. So mutation is a pretty common thing, not just in viruses, but in people too. Uh, you probably have a, a, a rich assortment of mutations in your body um, that weren't there when you were when you were born. Okay, so mutation is something that happens all the time. Uh, so the fact that these um, assumptions here of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium uh, are all violated, none of these things are likely to be true in hamsters or mice or cockroaches or fruit flies or corn uh, or beef cattle or humans tells you that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium doesn't hold. In other words, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is the null hypothesis, right? No difference. And clearly, that's not going to hold. In other words, populations are evolving all of the time. So organisms evolve. Very good. Uh, let's do a little exercise, and that's going to be your assignment for lab for this week. Uh, let's do a little exercise uh, and figure out how that works. Okay, so here I have a... Um, an Excel spreadsheet, and this Excel spreadsheet is uh, available to you. It's it's the button right next to the video button on the on the web page, um, and I've done all the work, all the hard work for you. Um, I'm modeling two different uh, scenarios here. So we're going to assume that these organisms are breeding at random. 
uh, and we're going to use flowers. So up here at the top, I have this row that says phenotype. Uh, remember, we have phenotypes and genotypes. The phenotype is what you see, and the genotype is what you get. Uh, so uh, the phenotype is, for example, if you are um, if you are 750 pounds and uh, four feet tall or something like that, uh, your phenotype would be short and wide. Okay, uh, but that isn't necessarily what your alleles are coding for. Your alleles might be coding for something very different, something that's short and skinny rather than short and fat. Um, but because you have this uh, craving for for donuts every morning and uh, Big Macs every afternoon uh, and steak and shake every evening, you've been packing on the pounds. Uh, so the genotype is what's there genetically and the phenotype is actually what's expressed. So all the other things that come into play like diet and lifestyle and things of that sort. All right, uh, so our phenotype, we have red flowers, pink flowers, and white flowers. Now the red flowers are big R, big R, that's the genotype. The pink flowers are big R, little r, right? And the white flowers are little r, little r. So let's imagine we begin with 100 red flowers, 20 pink flowers, and 200 white flowers. So we have a total of 320 flowers. Now the genotype frequencies, uh, let's make that column there just a little bit wider so that we can see all that. There we go. Um, the genotype frequencies uh, are going to be 0.313. So 31.3% of the flowers are red, 6.3% uh, of the flowers are pink, and 62.5% of the flowers are white. Now, the allele frequencies, I've computed them here. Um, the allele frequencies, uh, the frequency of the, the big R is 0.344, and the frequency of little r is 0.656. And if you highlight those, uh, you can see the equation up here um, that I use to, um, to get that. So here are the allele frequencies. And now what we're going to do is we're going to model this using our simple... Um, equation that you saw on the PowerPoint slide. Uh, we're going to model what's going to happen uh, if there is no selection. So this is the start. That's where we're starting, right? 0 0.313, uh, 0 0.063, and 0.625. And then here are the allele frequencies. So if there's no selection, in other words, if all organisms have equal survival and equal reproduction, notice what happens to the genotype frequency from generation one to generation two. So there's a change in the genotype frequency. We don't care about that. What we care about is the allele frequencies. And notice that the allele frequencies aren't changing. So the frequency of the big R allele stays constant. So we're doing this over 100 generations and there is no evolution in this system. Okay, the allele frequency, the genotype frequencies changed at first, right? But then nothing happened after that, okay? So you cannot rely on genotype frequencies to tell you if evolution has occurred. You can, however, rely on allele frequencies. And in this case, the allele frequencies did not change. Therefore, there was no evolution. Let's change the scenario a little bit now. And what we're going to do is we're going to have selection against the recessive allele. And that strength, the strength of that selection is going to be 0.1. In other words, what I've set up here is a model where the pressure against the small r allele is 10%. Okay. So every time you have reproduction, 10% of those small r alleles die. So now we've modeled it again. We have the same starting point and we have the same initial allele frequencies here. Okay. But now we have the selection built in and notice what happens with every generation. Notice what happens to the frequency of the little r allele. So the allele frequency for little r, we started off at 0.656. And now it's going down.
Okay, so it continues to decrease. And after 100 generations, it's gone all the way down to 11%. So it started off at It started off at 65% of the population, right, or 65% of the alleles, and ends up at 11%. Okay, let's double the strength of the selection. So instead of having 10% of the little r's removed, let's remove 20%. So let's change that to 0.2, and now let's see what happens. So at 10%, it was we went all the way down to 11%. Let's see what happens now. We've doubled the strength of it. Well, now it's 5% of the population. Let's strengthen it again. Let's make it really dramatic now. Let's make it 0.9, okay? In other words, now 90% of all the individuals with the little r allele, right, or 90% of the little r alleles are removed from the population. Now let's see what happens. And even when we do that, 1% of the population is going to, 1% of the alleles are going to be little r. In fact, what we could do is let's have total selection against that. So 100% of the little r alleles are going to be selected against. And now let's see what happens. and it hasn't changed much. Why is that? In other words, we have this insanely intense selection against the little r allele, and yet here we have a scenario where 1% of the population, 1% of the alleles that are out there are still going to be little r. What's happening? Well, what's happening is that the little r allele is protected to some extent by the heterozygote, okay? So the little r is selected against strongly there, but it's still conserved somewhat in the heterozygote. So in other words, even very strong selection, it's hard to remove an allele from the population. That's going to persist for a very long time. All right, so let's uh, use a real-world example of that, or let's think about a real-world example of that. Think about sickle cell anemia. Uh, sickle cell anemia is a uh, disease um, in which it's it's uh, just like this. In, in other words, you can have big S, big S, in which you have totally normal hemoglobin. You can be the heterozygote, in which half your red blood cells are normal and half are sickle-shaped. Or you can be the homozygous recessive in which, um, in which all of the alleles are sickle-shaped. Now, what happens if you are homozygous recessive, uh, your probability of survival is very low. If you're a heterozygote, that it's a situation where the selection coefficient is equal to one. Uh, if you're a heterozygote, you still persist, right? Um, why does the sickle cell anemia allele persist in the population? Well, there are two things. Number one, you see how difficult it is to remove that allele from the population if breeding is panmictic. But there is another important part of the story, and that is that sickle cell anemia tends to be prevalent in areas where there is a lot of malaria. And it turns out that, that have being the heterozygote in an area with malaria essentially protects you against malarial infection. So the parasite, right, for malaria can't get established if you are the heterozygote. So people in areas with malaria that are homozygous dominant suffer from malaria. People that are homozygous recessive die of sickle cell anemia, but the heterozygotes survive. So that's one of those weird scenarios where you have selection against both homozygotes and the heterozygote is, it's referred to as heterozygote superiority. The heterozygote is favored even though in a place where there's no malaria, there's strong selection against the, the recessive allele. Okay, so your homework assignment is going to be very simple this week. All I would like you to do 
is I want you to make a single graph and I want you to model what happens to this allele, to the little r allele, over time under different selection regimes. So uh, you, let's do uh, three scenarios. So r is equal to 0.1, r is equal to 0.5, and r is equal to 0.9. So you're going to make a graph. The predictor variable, the independent variable, is going to be generation. So you, your graph is going to go from 0 all the way to 100. So the x-axis is 0 to 100. The y-axis is going to be allele frequency of little r. Okay, so it's going to be this column right here. Okay, let's, let's highlight that column. Okay, let's... Uh, make that column in yellow just like that, okay? So that's going to be what's on the y-axis. You're going to put all three curves on the same graph. So you're going to label it, right? Generation is labeled for the x-axis. Label for the y-axis is going to be allele frequency of little r. And then you're going to have three curves. How do you do that? It's pretty easy. What I would do, the easiest thing to do, is to take simply this column right here and copy it. So you're going to highlight it right there, then Control C, and then you're going to move it over here and paste it. And let's replace the zero with, or let's play, replace start with zero. Okay. Now you're going to take this column right here. And you're going to highlight it, and you're going to hit Control C, and then you're going to come back over here, I guess we're going to have to do something with the first one, let's move over here, there we go, and now you're going to come over here to paste, and instead of just hitting Control V, you're going to drop here to where it says Paste Values, and you're going to paste them like that. Now you're going to come back up here, and you're going to replace that with 0.5, like that. And now you're going to highlight this column once again. Control C, and then back over here. And then you're going to paste again, but you're going to paste values there, okay? And then you're going to do that for the third time with r is equal to, come on, computer. You're going to do that the third time with r is equal to 0.9, okay? So let's just forget about this zero right here. You're going to make your graph from 1 to 100, okay? So this now is going to be your x-axis, and now you're going to have multiple data series for your y-axis. You're going to have one for the x, and then three data series for the y-axis. So it's going to be what kind of graph? It's going to be a scatter diagram. Whoops, let's go back over here to insert. It's going to be a scatter diagram like that. And then you're going to put lines on it, something like that. Okay, you can either use smooth lines or whatever. But it's going to be a scatter diagram with lines. So you're going to have three curves on this graph. That's your homework assignment. Okay, and then below that, a very simple sentence or two, if you're wordy, explaining what the graph is showing. Okay. And essentially, what you're showing is that it is very difficult, right, to completely remove an allele from a population, even under strong selection pressure. Very good. Um, that's all we've got for this week. Uh, if you have questions, obviously, don't hesitate to email me. Uh, but this should be pretty easy, uh, pretty easy to do, and uh, it should be a real plus in terms of the material that you're covering in lecture. Very good. I will see you guys next time.